Can everybody hear me okay in the back if I'm walking around? Yep, okay. Um, yeah, I, Candace mentioned the helicopter flight data monitoring community. Tomorrow there are two panel discussions where you'll have some of the world's experts in helicopter flight data monitoring from the technical side of things to um, the analysts and such like that. So come join us tomorrow afternoon. So find my little gizmo here. So optimizing SMS implementation. Um, there's a lot of documentation out there and a lot of guidance material about how to implement an SMS and what an SMS comprises of. The problem that I find with all this information, it, it just makes an SMS look bigger and bigger and bigger. And especially for small operators, they really struggle on how they're going to get down to the root of it and how to even get started. So that's what we're going to talk about here and how some of the tools from project management can really help an operator, regardless of what type of operation or what size of operation, to be able to implement their programs. So breaking it down to real simple, what do you have, what do you need, and how are you going to get it done? And I'll go through that. So you notice on your, on your tables there's pieces of paper and felt pens. There's also a couple little pads of sticky notes. I apologize. There are supposed to be flip charts everywhere, so we're just going to make do with what we got. So we're going to start with what do you have, and this is where you guys get to work. Um, each table, I'm going to get to be a department, and I didn't expect so many people, so this is going to be interesting. But um, let's make you guys the flight operations department. And ground ops, all right. Maintenance? Maintenance department, right on. Uh, you guys, actually, with only two of you, do you want to join this table here? So who wants to be in, you guys want to be in an airport? Or a heliport? You can decide which one you want. Uh, engineering, uh, design engineers. That looks like this table over here. Business, marketing, uh, the back there. And do you guys want to join another table? That would be great. So business and marketing. So you're the ones that are going to work on the, on the proposals and the request for proposals, tenders, that sort of thing. Uh, passenger services. Let me see how many we got left. Um, could you two tables merge together? And then this is passengers. And ops control. You guys are ops control or you could join another table if you like. And the last one, safety. You get to be the safety and quality department. Isn't that great? OK, so what I'd like you to do is if each table could just list the functions, what does your department do? Just list them out and as a start. So I'll just give you a few minutes to do that. OK, so how are we all doing? It pretty much have some sort of a list going? Okay, so what I'll ask is if each table, somebody could just read out what their department is and what their, um, what it is their functions are. So we'll start with flight ops here. Do you hear, uh, no, probably not. They're having too much fun back there. <laughs> that, I wish I had one to hang around. Um, yeah, okay, so what do we got? We got for flight operations department, we have flight following, flight crew, uh, training schedule, and assurance. Okay, good. And you are maintenance department. Oh, sorry, you're, you're ground ops, okay. Um, all right, I'll read that out. Management of ramp, baggage, aircraft maneuvers, fueling, handling and towing, environmental, so snow, uh, bird control, movement, taxi clearances, ramp security, cargo, cargo and passenger and de-icing. Yeah, that's a good chunk. Move over to here. What have you guys got? Engineering and design, providing drawing for modifications, STCs, yep, repair scheme, maintenance program, testing, design validation and certification. Yeah, right into the regulatory side of things. Okay, so for business and marketing, what we do is obtain new customers through advertising, write up contracts, proposals, 
design strategies for the operation of the business, monitor market growth, set up budgets, set department goals and measure success with KPIs, participate in companies SMS and complete risk assessments. Interesting. Oops, I wasn't supposed to go that part. <laughs> All right. Um, for passengers, we have catering, ticketing, check-in, dangerous goods, entertainment, flight attendants, safety briefing, customer service, that includes complaints and conflict resolution, training and uniforms. Yeah. Ops control, flight following, scheduling of passengers, dispatch, clearances, weather forecast, flight planning, aircraft availability, safety requirements. Good list. We've got a lot of stuff going on. We're just about running an airline by now. Heliport, maintain facilities, bird control, ensure security, lighting, snow removal, emergency response, maintain regulatory compliance, environmental factors, communication, service and ATC, nav aids, weather station, and fuel. Ah, these guys are cheating. They're adding. <laughs> I'll leave you, leave you to write for a moment. Okay, SMS and quality services. Ensure we have a system suitable to the size of the company, effective system. Facilitate reporting, data collection, tracking, trending, investigations, corrective action plans, feedback, communication, audit system, continuous improvement, SMSC, oh, committees, training, manuals and procedures, emergency response plans, and health, environment, safety, security. Must be a CHC table. You're still fixing things. <laughs> no! Okay. Um, maintenance. Uh, fix aircraft. Stock. Oh. Spare parts. Track spare parts. Schedule between maintenance. And unscheduled, yes. Um, conformity. And col competency. Collaborate with other departments. Oh, I like that last one. Because look what we had when we talked, when we re read off the list. There was a few that put the same thing down, didn't they? And I was especially happy to see emergency response. Uh, somebody said fueling. There's towing, cargo, weight and balance. So when you start looking at these things, you start realizing that there are more than one department doing the same type of thing and, or providing for the next department to do their part, right? So we get into this overview of what a department did. And what you guys just did was the beginning of a system description. And when you do something like ground handling, um, this is just a you know, quick mock-up. It's not everything, obviously. But if you look at things like fuel, right? Um, airport provides fuel. And we mentioned towing, weight and balance. So the weight and balance is uh, an important part of flight operations. And yet, who does it? somebody in cargo, if you're in a, in a fixed wing and you get your weight and balance wrong, you want to do those tail strikes, right? So do the cargo people understand about weight and balance and how important it is to get that right? Um, and, oops, anti-de-icing. Um, not so big in Dubai, northern Canada, yeah, really big deal most of the year. Um, cleaning, cargo. When you look at maintenance, minimum equipment lists, and how that deals with um, the flight operations. So there's a couple overlaps there too. Supply chain from engineering, um, OEMs, somebody has to talk to those guys, right? Manuals, inventory, records, training. There was a number of places that talked about training in various departments. So when you start putting this together, you start actually getting a map if you just take your subject matter experts in each of the departments and just tell them, what do you do? In your silo, what do you do? List it out. You can start to map it. And you can start to see little patterns emerging. So emergency response. It's under ground handling. Big part, especially if you're an airport. Um, ground handling is usually the first line of defense if there's a crash anywhere near the airport. Well, it also hits for the airline, so the, the company, um, marketing, business, those are the guys who are going to be coaching and standing up in front of the camera when, and coaching the CEO to stand up in front of a camera. There's a huge element for business continuity in emergency response planning. 
We have emergency response for the airport, fire, um, emergency services, um, rerouting aircraft, ATC. You know, th this all starts to fit together. So when you have everything listed and every department knows what it does within its own silo, then you have to start seeing what matches up. Who else is doing this? And are they talking to each other? Do your manuals talk to each other? Do they integrate? Do you have a document management system or a content management system that will allow you to say, okay, well, is this emergency response manual for airports conducive to the way the flight operations manage its emergency response or ground operations? Who's a third part party contractor that is hired by the airport authority that is liaising with the operations and the marketing guys who write the contracts, right? So you start getting this whole mix up. So you have to make sure that when you map this out, you know what starts to link. So what do you do next? Take one simple one like fuel. Fuel has an entire process that goes with it, right? Simple part of it. So you have to get it. You have to buy it from somewhere. It's got to get to the airport or the barrel in the middle of the desert, whatever your helicopter needs. It has to have quality, so is somebody testing it? Is the storage facility correct so that it's going to be able to manage this fuel without getting any water into it and any contaminations and storage and such? Um, you're going to need equipment to be able to get that to the aircraft. So you deliver it, you connect the dispenser, so you can start if you start running through this, you go, okay, wait a minute here. In almost each one of these, pretty well, you're looking at a whole bunch of hazards, right? Especially when you're looking at fuel. How is it stored? Is there a no smoking sign next to it? Um, the quality of it, big hazards involved with that. The equipment just to deliver the fuel in that, whether the, whether the dispensers are lock in the way they're supposed to lock in, or if you're doing in remote access and you're doing it out of barrels, that's an even more of a hazard situation when you've taken a hose out and you're siphoning it out virtually. So delivery to aircraft, connecting dispenser, does that work properly? You're refueling it, what are the procedures? What's happening around you? So what are the other people doing? Is somebody talking on their cell phone? And from what I understand, the hazard around the cell phone is not so much, oh, I always do that, sorry. Um, is not so much that something's going to happen to the cell phone, but you drop it, create a spark, brown fuel vapor, not a lot of fun. The record management around that, and then they return it to fuel station. So when you have a system description, you start pulling that apart, your subject matter experts can get down to a fine detail. And each one of these can have its own set of policies and procedures and what happens. So again, you're dealing with interfaces. Return to fuel station, so the facilities. So the airport needs to look at their part of things. How do they manage the, the fuel management system? How do they manage what they have to do? And how do they make it safe to go to the next one? So a system description identifies the functional areas. You can map this out using that. Mine was just on Invisio. There's mind map type things, Mind Genius. Our company makes that one. Um, identifies the interfaces, and that's the really important part, especially when you're talking about high-risk areas, such as emergency response, fueling procedures, um, taxing takeoff, landing. Whenever you have a whole group of people from disparate organizations dealing with the same thing, there's a high risk involved. So you have to know what your hazards are, and you have to know who's handling what and have all that coordinated. So you can identify your hazards and threats that way, allows for coordinated response and managing risk. So what do you have? And that's the first part of project management. You want to know what you're starting with. Model of the organization, the interfaces. There's another part of this, that when you start building a system description, and it's described by ICAO, um, just not very well. It just says it's a description of your company and how you do things. Well, that doesn't really give you a lot of background on how to actually do a system description. But when you start going around your departments and saying, okay, write down what you have. What do you do? It starts to engage them. Why are we doing this? Why are you making me do more work, right? 
It's change management. It starts to engage them in the process. And with that, and when you start looking at the hazards and threats and how they're related between the different departments, it starts to get a recognition going there. Um, the other thing it does is it shows up redundancies. I did a project once and um, I needed flight hours. This is for, for the, the database. And I needed flight hours to be able to do our analysis on, by, per 100,000 flight hours, various incidents and accidents and such things, right? So I did a really quick and dirty, how do I get flight hours and how is that managed within the company? Very big company. Well, right off the bat, I got 16 different places that the same number is being put in. The pilots are collecting it for flight duty times in their logbooks. It's going on to the flight, um, the rosters. It's going into uh, the invoicing system, which had to be re-entered because it wasn't all tied together. Um, every time that that number got added to another system, you're looking for more um, errors and you're also looking for a lot of wasted efficiencies. So now, I was very happy to hear actually just a couple of weeks ago that the company now has a system where it's from chalks off to chalks on, um, they're collecting it on iPads through electronic flight bag. One number goes wherever it is supposed to go. According to contract, whether it's chalks on, chalks off, or rotor start, whatever the issue, then it's all being collected and it's all being funneled into one place. Imagine how much efficiency is gained there from 16 different people putting all these numbers into place. So you can find a lot of things like that as well. So a couple of examples of, of system descriptions. It's no different than a fault tree analysis. Right? This is just a generic one that I pulled straight out of a book. Um, oh, I didn't put the book down. That was from a paper from a university and accident causality mapping. It's pretty much the same thing. It's a description visually of what it is that happened rather than what is there. Hazard log. While you're going through this whole process, you can start to put your hazards together, right? Um, you can list them. Regardless of what you already have, you can go through it, and it's an excellent brainstorming thing because if you're used to working off the same hazard log and everybody's working off of that, there might be something else out there. So when you look at it from fresh eyes and brainstorming, just the way you guys did for, for your departments, even if you, you don't have any, um, you've never run an airport before, but so we've all been to airports. You can kind of see what happens out there and come up with this. So you get your subject matter experts in there and you get the people in there from various places so that they can ask questions, right? So you want your hazards listed. You want to know where your interfaces are. You want to know where your high risk areas are. So from there, you've got a document uh, now, a picture of what you need. And you don't have to do the entire company at one time. If you're a really big company, that would just, it would be onerous. Start with your high risk areas, flight operations, maintenance, engineering, ground operations, you know, if that's what you're doing, right? You don't have to do it all at one time. You can do it piece by piece. And gradually, you will build this up over time. So the next question is, what do you need? You have to start looking at, well, what do we need to get to? Well, what are your regulations? Everybody has a pretty good idea of what those are. And contracts, um, if you're marking business department, you've got the company into all kinds of things that they have to see whether it's contract compliance. Some oil and gas companies, every aircraft is a separate contract, which means that the types get a little bit missed up. You have you know, different equipment on different aircraft and you have different requirements for billing and everything like this from the same company. It gets quite onerous. And then you want to look at best practice. So you look at documents like the OGP standards, you know, decide what out of that is required, what out of that is a good idea for your company. The hazard log, at this point, all you want to do is just prioritize it. Look at your, because as ICAO and everybody says, you want to focus first on the area of highest risk. So flight operations usually gets it first, right? But, and maintenance and that sort of thing. Then you're gonna start looking at your mitigations. What do you have in place already? How do you manage these gaps? Um, or how do you manage the hazards? How do you manage the risks? So exercise number two, very straightforward. There's an aircraft in the hangar and it's gonna take off. Each group, just quick 
I'll give you five minutes for this one of just, okay, there's an aircraft in the hangar. Who's involved in getting it from the hangar until it takes off on the runway or heliport? Okay, it looks like we've got a pretty good set of lists going here. Now, how many peop people started with maintenance? Couple, yep. Yeah. It's already been maintained? Aha, uh -huh. right on. And it had to get fueled? Uh, somebody towed it out, it could have been a pilot or an engineer. Could have been ground operations. Mm -hmm. Supplies. Uh, might want to have to put a pilot on there. So there's scheduling, there's rostering. <laughs> Although there were drones operating on this, on this table here. Um, from there, you have to get ATC clearance. Well, you have to start the aircraft up. You have to get your ATC clearance. You have to make sure all the checks are done. And then you're going to continue from there. But look at the exercise. Even the tables that didn't have pilots on there that have actually gone through this procedure, you, it's pretty intuitive, isn't it? You know, the, the main areas that you have to do. And look at the lists of the people that are involved in that. You've got at least four or five departments just to get it from hangar to takeoff. You know? So there's a whole bunch of interfaces. And that's when the aircraft is moving or about to move. So you've just elevated the risk there from just being in your organization to aircraft in motion, one of the highest hazards we've got. So again, you want to start looking at what do you need? What hazards are in your operation? What gaps to where you want to go? So you're going to look at, I think you're going to look at, oh, there we go. So the interfaces. You've got internal, dep uh, the departments, the functions, different shifts, handovers. That uh, can be a risks in there, individual roles between one, how one person does it and how another person does it. So you start looking at back to the training sort of side of things. And whether your manuals are there to back these people up, the procedures. And then of course you got the external. So when we got the ground operations towing the aircraft out, it's not the pilot. So do they have the same procedures? Do they have the same level of training? Might want to look at that. Um, clients. They can be a real pain sometimes, and they don't always listen to what you're saying. So passengers, clients, contractors, whatever it is that you've got out there. And third parties, we've got regulatory authorities, so the regulations that manage the aircraft to a minimum standard, and then best practices over that. So you've got a lot of interfaces on just doing a small, seemingly small thing. So this is where your system description really comes in handy is because it, you can start mapping these interfaces out. And when you're doing procedures, same thing. You've got your procedure mapped out, just as we showed in the fuel, and then you can start looking at who's involved with that, and are we coordinated? Are we on the same page? Are we doing things effectively, efficiently? Right? So SMS gap analysis, this is the ICAO um, checklist. Um, there's a 2012 version out. Um, it's, this one's, yeah, this one's from the 2012 version. Um, I, I don't know exactly what they're doing there, but I think when Annex 19 comes out from ICAO, it's supposed to be out about November or so, and so the draft um, SMM, the 9859 document that's out right, um, has been put out in draft form or something like this. It's a little bit more robust than the other one, but it's, you know, I've, I've heard different opinions on whether it's uh, better than the second version or, or worse. Um, from there, you're going to start looking, once you've figured out which gaps are, you have to start figuring out what you're going to do about them. And only on paper it's at the first point. And again, focusing on the areas of highest risk. So you don't want to go for your whole company. And this is where the small operators especially start to freak out, is they go, my God, it's so big. Well, it doesn't have to be. Focus on your areas of highest risk. Focus on your flight operations, maintenance procedures. Um, interfaces with the ground operations and, thing, and the interfaces there. Get an understanding of what the organization is. And then you can go description of the gap and then you can start going to the action plan. And at first it's just an action plan because if you identify something and immediately go out, 
and start fixing it, there's knock-on effects to that. So you have to, change management is huge. That's the area that takes the most focus. When you're gonna change something, what does that affect? And your system description and your procedures description can start to map that out for you. So if I change this, if I change the procedure for fueling an aircraft, where's the knock-on effect of that? Is it different equipment? Is it different people? Is it different training? And what does that do to the operators when they've got passengers on board, so the procedures that are involved in that, or not procedures on, or passengers on board. So when you've got your hazard log, you've done your gap analysis for safety management systems, regulations, contractual requirements. When you've got that kind of mapped out, then you start looking at the bigger picture. Bow ties, um, I think you're probably pretty familiar with these things. Um, excellent tool for identifying things, putting a picture on the wall, just like a system description, where you can sit there and go, is this complete? And somebody looks at it, oh, you missed a piece. Oh, okay, well, we can write that in. That's where sticky note exercises. Most of the system descriptions I've done is just using sticky notes on a wall. You know, just write it all out, put it up, and then start organizing it after that. So same thing with the bow tie. The risks, or sorry, the threats on the left in the blue, the controls, and bow tie has a, the ability to flag it for partially effective or fully effective, that type of thing. And then it also has for where your documents are. What describes that control? And how many of them do you need? And so when you're doing your gap analysis, you can say, oh, you know what? This one, we don't have that one. You know, we don't have anything that's gonna control this issue. So you can start building it up from there. So interface management, gaps, duplications, efficiencies, human factors, hot spots. That's the big one. When somebody's taking the fuel dispenser off the aircraft, what are the possible errors that can make? And what can the organization do to make that simpler for the person? Either through equipment, through a second set of eyes, through uh, some sort of, um, you know, ABC, this is what you do, right? So the organization's role in all of this is to provide the tools, the resources, everything that they need for the people to do their job effectively. They're the pointy end of the stick and they're the ones that are gonna pay if it goes. So what we wanna make sure of is that the organization knows exactly what it's doing, how the procedures are done, what tools are gonna be most effective and how we provide that to the staff through training, through time, through experience, through expertise, all these things so we can give them everything that they need to, to do their job. So how will it be done? Stakeholders, um, we've been talking a little bit about that because you've listed out from getting the aircraft from start to, uh, from hangar to takeoff, you were listing a number of people that were involved or departments that were involved. So stakeholders are a really important part of, of project management. Um, you have to know who your stakeholders are and they're not always the people that are in the department. They are sometimes with you, is a great one from the States, you're either with us or against us. Both sides are stakeholders, whether they like it or not. And I can't remember what comes up now. Yeah, okay, little story. This is a real story from Vancouver. Um, I, I was born and raised here, I live in Scotland now. But we have big trees in backyards and a um, architect had two young boys and built a tree house in his trees, something like that one. Fancy structure, great ladders going up and a fire pole going down the whole bit. So he built this thing in the backyard. Well, the neighbor didn't like it because from the balcony, they could see straight down into her property. And with all these trees and hedges and tall fences, she didn't like that much. So when you have this, she went out and uh, complained to the city and the city said, well, the, the design of this um, tree house is such, it's large, it's big, and it's close to the property line, and you don't have a building permit, so you have to take it down. The guy didn't want to take it down and fought it for two years with lawyer's fees, and they, he tried to get a building permit, and they declined him, saying it's too close to property line, so you would never be, we would never have given you a building permit in the first place. So. 
he had to tear his, after two years, ended up with a $500 fine and he had to take the treehouse down. So there's a whole bunch of work went into this and it's only because he didn't manage his stakeholders. If he had talked to his neighbor beforehand and said, here's the plan, she could have said, uh, maybe move it over somewhere else. Um, so there was a whole bunch of animosity that goes. So stakeholders are not always your friends. So you have to manage that as well. You have to bring them. There's a 20-60-20 rule that says if you'd make a change, 20% will go, yeah, okay, that's pretty well okay. 60% will just sit there and wait, they'll sit on the fence, wait for which ones are going forward, which ones are going, and the, the, the last 20% that says, we're not coming with you. And they'll, some of them will actively go against you. So you have to manage that as well. So for better, for worse, you gotta deal with this guy. And you wanna make sure you're identifying all your stakeholders, what their strengths are, what they can bring, what they're gonna fight you on, and how do you get them to come along with you. Um, I'm gonna skip this one, because otherwise we're probably gonna run out of time. I was gonna get you to pick a gap in your thing, but uh, I didn't expect such a big group, so we'll skip that. So I'm gonna get a little bit more into more of a presentation mode here. Um, and talk a little bit about project management. Um, it's been a long time, it's been around for a long time. I mean, these things were built with project management. You have to start one thing after another. And the, what happens over time is things change. In, in these days, when you had project managers, you just, you know, you had kings and things that were building these structures. So, you know, it's behind schedule or more money, well, just tax them more and get more slaves. You know, you just keep adding that. But at some point in time, we couldn't do that anymore. So they started looking at project management. Now, these guys here, um, Frederick Taylor and Henry Gantt, we all know about Gantt charts, and they're still used today, and, and honestly, until about the 1990s, the only thing that's changed with Gantt charts is the dependency line since he came up with them. Um, he died in 1919. So you can imagine how long we've been using Gantt charts. It's an excellent tool. It will look at your dependencies between one activity and the next activity. And you can build that one out. We went to the Plan, Do, Check, Act, which of course is part of the quality management system. And we talk about that a lot in ICAO, in the regulations, and putting a safety management system into place. You want to make sure that you plan for what you're doing so that you can manage your risks. Once you've done it, you make sure it's working and you continue that cycle over and over again. So project management is a discipline. And I'm not gonna go into this. Project management courses are, you know, minimum three days just for an introduction. But the important thing to remember with project management is that it is a discipline. People are trained in this and they're trained in different knowledge areas to be able to use them for whatever type of project they're working on. Now, what happens a lot is that we use project management in areas like maintenance to make sure that the right component gets put on at the right time, you know, with the right tools and all that sort of stuff. Um, that we have the budget to do so and that we're sticking to the budget or the timelines. We don't look at it so much for organizational change. And that's the difference with safety management systems because that, for the most part, is organizational change. I was talking to, um, when I was consulting, I was talking to a, a very large company about um, doing some work for them. And um, I said, well, what kind of projects do you have on the go? And he goes, well, we actually don't have projects here. <laughs> you don't have projects here. And so the perception of what is a project, right? So it's a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. And it's everything but day-to-day -day operations. So what you wanna get to, when you wanna think of a project, it's something that you're not doing all the time. It's an idea and it goes to planning and we're gonna do something about it and then once it's got going and it's working properly and we're getting the results that we want, then we're gonna transition it to operations. 
make sure that's all understood and integrated with documenting that. Um, and then that becomes part of day-to-day -day -day operations. It's no longer a project. So we get the next one going. And here I've got closed, and that is a really important part. In the closing part of a project, you're documenting, you're, make, you're finalizing all your reports, you're making sure you were on budget or over budget, um, under budget. How did you do? How did the project do? What did you learn from this? So we want to make sure that everything we've learned from putting this thing in place is kept for the next time we go through it. So project management, what does that do? Application of the knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to project activities to meet the project requirements. And that's a really important term. The term meet requirements. We're not looking to exceed requirements. And it's the same with the quality management system. We want to figure out what it is we need to do and we want to meet that. Scope creep is one of the biggest problems in project management and that is when you decide you're going to exceed customer expectations or you're going to exceed this. How do you do that and maintain quality? You want to make sure that what you say you're going to do, you're going to do. If you need to change that, you run it through a change management process, the plan, do, check, act again. You're running it through that process to say, okay, if we change the scope, um, change the budget, change the amount of time, what does that do to the project? If I, triple constraint, if I say, okay, the boss comes around and says, okay, I know I gave you to next April to finish it off, it's got to be done by mid-March now. What does that do? Do you jump ahead and say, yeah, can do attitude, right? So what does that do? Do you have to increase your budget so that you can add people to the project? Do you take something out of the project so that you can meet that deadline? What will it take to manage that to meet expectations? Can it be done? And it might mean that there's a solid dis uh, discussion that goes on that says, you know what, we can do that. But what will happen is we're going to have to dump this module out we can't do that at the same time. Um, it's going to have to be done at some later date, otherwise the whole thing won't work properly, but we can do this without this piece for the moment. So that is a very, very important part. Scope creep can kill a product. Now the ICAO safety management system, and this is what I like about merging project management and safety management systems, is they're really pretty much the same thing. If you take the ICAO definition of an SMS, all you do is change SMS and safety to project management and project, and you've got the same definition. So it dovetails beautifully. It's got all the same processes and procedures. It's got quality management built into it. So of course I can do anything with statistics. Um, the Standage Group has a chaos report. It comes out once a year. This is a think tank in the States. They look at IT projects. And that's the way they find they can measure it because IT project, you can pretty well, when the final product is out there, you can pretty well say, yes, it's successful. No, it's not successful. Yes, it was over budget. No, it didn't come to fruition. So 31% of IT projects are canceled before completion. 31%. So a third of all projects started just get nuked. So imagine how much money and time and effort goes into that prior to nuking it. Half of them cost over what they put originally planned. And one in eight are considered successful. That means meeting expectations. So that's pretty damning numbers, really, when you look at project management. And probably the last five, 10 years is really starting to hit IT. It hasn't made a lot of change. And we wonder why that is. And the Standish Group is looking at it going, well, how come our numbers aren't changing all that much? So another group started looking at it differently. Instead of just saying, okay, did it meet time? Did it meet budget? Did it meet expectations? They looked at the processes. So for 100 companies, and these are the, out of the Fortune 500 companies that implemented project management, they found a lot of improvements. The projects were called successful, not because of time and budget, but because the client or the product was something that was useful and valued to the company. So when we look at this, 54% in financial performance, that's a pretty good return on investment. 
But what I like about that is down here. So when you're looking at safety management system projects, you start looking 38% in customer satisfaction. So if you look at your stakeholders, who are your customers? They're your clients, they're your staff, between one department and another. I mean, design engineering is taking care of maintenance, right? They're feeding uh, each other. So customer satisfaction and employee satisfaction because they're not constantly being told that, you know, like <coughs> to shift directions at all times. I don't know how many times you've had that in your career where you get started in one way and somebody comes along and says, no, you're going to do it this way now. Uh, yeah, right. So what they've found when they do the research is that project management works. So looking a little bit at what a project is, these are the five phases of project. Um, control is from start to finish. I can call all quality management. Um, initiation, this is the level of activity and phase to finish, this is time on the edge. So initiation, this is where the ideas are, it's figuring out what you have, what you need, doing the gap analysis. Then you start planning how you're actually gonna do it. So you have to look at the change management. What resources do you need? What funding do you need? How much time have you got? So especially when you're implementing an SMS, you don't wanna do it all in one shot. Do you wanna just start with an area? Get it up and running. Make sure that your processes are working because then you can apply the lessons learned to other areas, right? As you can imagine, the implementation actually doing it takes the most activity and the longest amount of time. You wanna put a lot of planning up front and if you do your planning right, you'll get a lot more bang for your buck on the far side. Close, and you can see these things overlap. And I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute, but these things are not linear. You don't get to end of one phase and go, okay, now we're gonna start the next. You can still be planning chunks of the project where you're going, okay, well, we're ready for this piece. We can start implementing there. Lots of tools. Um, business analysis and project management fit hand in hand. So functional and technical specs. It's, a, it's the name for what do you need and what do you have. Functional specs is if all the money was available and all the time and all the resources, what would it look like? I mean, it's not real world, but what would we, what would do we want? We want to reduce our accident rate. Do we want to reduce our component failures? Do we want to reduce our AOGs? Do we want to increase passenger um, feedback? What is it that you want? Um, technical specs is the reality check. That's when you go, okay, we have this much money, this many people, this much time, right? So we're gonna put that into phase. And then that's gonna, we might model it. We might say, okay, what's it gonna look like? So that goes back to the system descriptions again. Okay, well, this is what we have, and these are the interfaces that we have. So how are we going to start bridging these gaps? How are we gonna get, do we need contracts? Or do we need to just hold our vendors um, to our contracts? I see this a lot in the industry, is when you have a contract between the oil and gas company, for example, and a helicopter operator, is each aircraft on a different contract? How does that work? And are they actually contractually compliant? Are they able to be contractually um, compliant? This happens a lot in some countries where, you know, there's only, you know, an oil and gas company moves into an area and there is only one operator there that can do the charters back and forth from the fields. Are they up to where you would like them? And does your contract specify that? If they're not there, what are you gonna do about it? Your passengers are on that aircraft. You know, so how are we gonna manage this? Communication, or sorry, documentation has to be documented. You can't measure what you can't document. Communication collaboration, you have to have all these parties working together. Software can help. And if you are building a safety management system, there is a number of software you need. One of them is a reporting software because if you're not collecting the data, unless you're a one or two chip operator, if you don't have software that is collecting data and able to analyze it and you're working off your brain or an Excel spreadsheet because you're not gonna be able to get the information out that you need. And some of these software programs are really useful as far as corrective action planning. You can do project management for these. You know, you're, you're gonna implement a project you're listing your activities, you go, oh, okay, that's a mess implementation of the report. I'm gonna put 10 corrective actions on there and I'm going to assign them to people 
they get the emails, they get the timelines, and they get the communication on one system. And as they close things, and the documentation for everything happens, then it could close on the other system. So you can use that. Microsoft Project works as well, but uh, to get the most bang for your buck, you need a lot of training and these things. So if you have a software that's managing the case management system in your nation, use that. It can work just as well. Project life cycles, I'll get that to that in a minute, but knowledge and skills, people's knowledge and skills of project management and the subject that they are going to be implementing. So the first part, project initiation needs assessment. So relevant information. So when we're looking at what do we have and what do we want, what do we need, we're looking at contracts, regulations, uh, laws. I was just in a legal um, seminar uh, before lunch remind you of laws, family assistance law in the U.S. I worked with a large airline in, um, in another country that was flying into the U.S. and I was looking at the emergency response planning. They had a great manual. Um, it had no, um, it was not in the slightest bit involved with what it actually they did. They had no interface management between the airports where they flew in their country and then when I start looking at what they're flying, where they're flying to and what the regulations and law are, they were not compliant to U.S. law. So my advice to them was to write a very big check to one of the emergency response companies so that at least they would be legal and then start building their own emergency response plan up and get their people trained. So there was a big gap that they'd never recognized because they didn't know what the laws were in the, in the places that they're flying to. UK CAA has, a, or the United Kingdom, has a very similar law to the Family Assistance Law in the States. So needs assessment, research, find out what it is you need. You may not be re not realizing. Uh, the feasibility and the benefits, what are we going to get out of this? It could simply be compliance, and that's what you're going to get out of that. But safety management systems, the further you push it, the more you're going to get out of it. Leadership and commitment, of course, you can't do it without. The top of the company has to walk the talk, and they have to communicate it. So a bit about project life cycles. Um, there's different types of project life cycles. There's three main ones. And a project manager who's conversant in these will be able to look at it, but it's, it, it's not rocket science. So you can kind of look at things, especially if you've got a large company. Um, you're going to be breaking things up into smaller chunks anyway. So you're going to look at your highest risk first, and then you're going to go on from there. So you're going to look at the level of risk, potential changes to requirements. So you're going to want to look at what are your requirements and are they going to change over time? Operational environment and the culture, and I can't stress that one enough. Organizational, professional, and national. What do you have? There's some measurement tools for this. There's some companies out there that specialize this. Well, they will do um, interviews, they will do assessments, they will do questionnaires that are well done to really understand, do your ground staff have the same perception of safety and management as the management do, as the executive do? And if not, why not? So what kind of culture do you have in your organization? Professional cultures are different. So the pilots and engineers, that's the famous one. But the administration staff, the people who deal with customer service compared to the people who deal with machines. Different types of professional cultures and of course national cultures. And this is one that um, I struggle with sometimes because most of the guidance material for safety management systems is done with a Western bias. It's written for the Western world, and it doesn't necessarily fit in another part of the world. I mean, Scotland is very different than Nigeria, which is different than Australia, which is different than China, which is different than Southeast Asia. There's different cultures that are going on here. So does the same thing work in one country as it does in another? And I don't know the answer to that, and only the people who are there and understand it fully know what they want to get to are going to be able to judge that and modify how they do things in order to get the required results. So waterfall. This is a really straightforward one. If anybody's built anything in Ikea, they do one step at a time, do this, do this, do this, and that, and when you're finished, you'll have um, your cupboard or your Billy Bookshelf. So all the phases are in order. They're planned, scheduled, and resource. Now, you can overlap them. So a Billy Bookshelf, you can put a couple of pieces together and then, and then finalize things um, at the end. 
mostly in construction and maintenance in here because there you have a fairly linear thing. You can't build, when you look at the picture, that one, they say you can't build the house until you've built the foundation and the floor in that. Well, that's not necessarily true because somebody's been building these upside down houses for some time. It's pretty, it's pretty cool. Um, iterative. The phases are broken down in chunks. So you're doing it in small chunks. And so you start to look at this, a safety management system, you can't start in the very beginning and then get to the end. Now, when you look at ICAO's documentation and the four pillars, um, the four components and 12 elements, um, they have it pretty much of an iterative structure to it. They say do component one, then do component two, then do component three, and then component four. And a lot of the regulations are going this way where they say, okay, you phased an approach. In year one, you will do this. And by year two, we expect you to see, to see this. The problem I have with that is that assurance, safety assurance is step three. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Shouldn't you be building assurance into everything that you do? Shouldn't it be coming into step one, right? So you have to look at your organization and what makes sense for that. Um, it is more flexible to needs and changes and it manages risks. Um, Iterative can work in a lot of situations. My favorite, though, is the agile methodology. And the reason for this is because it's extremely adaptive. And unless you've got a lot of experience in implementing SMS in different environments, in different operational cultures, in different types of operations, you're not going to have the experience of implementing things. You're going to have subject matter experts that are really good at their area. You're going to have the flight ops. You're going to have the passenger services. You're going to have these areas where somebody knows that really, really well. So you need that expertise to help you design what's going to work for that area. It's constant collaboration. It's doing little pieces at a time with a plan, do, check, act inside each little step. So you, you, you test the waters. You're going forward a little bit and you're going, okay, what worked about that? What didn't work about that? Did we get engagement? Somebody said the other day here um, that if you implement a change, it takes two years to have that completely integrated so that people, that becomes habit. It's like putting a seatbelt on in a car. When it first became law, we all started putting our seatbelts on. Now I just feel really weird if I don't have a seatbelt on in the car. But how long did that take before it, I actually felt that way? You know, so, and some people I know never wear a seatbelt. Wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable. So it's using the iterative development process. So you're using this plan, do, check, act within one little area. So the traditional waterfall, iterative and agile. Now I'm going to bend it a little bit. Because what I'm going to say here, when, when you're looking at these ones here, you're looking at plan, do, check, act. But it's going in smaller and smaller chunks the farther down you get. So we're going to look at program management. And at several related projects, intention of improving organizational improvement. So this is the difference between having a project manager who understands how to build a high rise and a project manager who can do organizational change. You're managing lots of projects. One project might just be the documentation. One project might be awareness training. One project could be just getting the posters, the, you know, the, the 7 dirty deeds, 12 dirty deeds, whatever they're called. You might just be getting that up there and building an awareness project, and you're going to do that step by step. Um, hazards, just in flight ops or just in ground ops. You might just be getting those things up. So each one of these is working at the same time as another one, but you're looking at them holistically, and that's where the system description becomes really powerful because you start seeing how these things link together. So this is the final model. You, you may use waterfall in some things. Some areas, that's just the way you have to do it because it is literally a step-by-step -step process. Oops. Ah, thank you. Adaptive learning. And agile. You can use all of these for your SMS, right? It's all project management and it's all been trained. There, there's degrees in this, there are courses in this, there's online YouTube on this, it's great. But if you looked at it, 
of a program strategy. If you look at SMS as a program, and each project has a strategy to it, and that could be just pieces, it could be by department, it could be by operation, it could be by contract, it could be any way that works for your organization. The project strategy chooses which one works best for the project. And you can have them all running together. Oh, sorry, not sky. So within that, you have change management. It's a formal procedure. I mentioned that before. That's when, s if something changes, it's not necessary that you can't change things, that it's written in stone. You just have to recognize that these changes have risks, risks to the project. And when you're looking at risk for introduction of new type of aircraft, there's a whole process that you go through in order to make sure you're managing all your risks in that, or a new operation, new base of operations. So you're looking at a formal procedure. So if you have a project and you've got it scoped out, you've got it planned out, but you go, you know what? This isn't working so well. So let's make a change. All right. Formal procedure. Check with your stakeholders, the ones that are with you and against you, and see if they've forgotten something. Or am I missing a piece? Did I think of everything? And one person can't do that. So that's where the teamwork comes in. Agreement. Then document the changes and make sure that's what goes forward. On the safety side, you're looking at risk assessment and management and the communication and the data that you're collecting. So the plan to check act, is this working well? Make sure that you're documenting as you go. And of course, there's the people. The adaptive methodology, when you're doing projects in an adaptive style, you, you want the small iterations because people don't like big changes, right? We, we don't mind little changes. We can adapt a little bit at a time, but you have to watch also the, you know, the weariness of change. If, it's con if change is constant, you know, sometimes you need to let it settle. But if you're using an agile methodology, you're, you're, you're watching this go by, and you can put a hold to it and say, oh, yeah, let's just leave it here for a while. Let's let stew in this spot, and then let's move over to this area and work on that for a while. Just put, let this sink in for a bit. People, it's also dependent on culture. And it's dependent on, on all three types, the organizational culture, the professional, the national. You want to make sure that it's working well because that's who you're relying on is the people. So a project plan. It can be as simple as an Excel spreadsheet. It can use the SMS type software, the tools that support them. Uh, you can use Microsoft Project. You can hot put your dependencies or you can just you know, do a checklist and say, okay, this is, the, this is the type of life cycle that's gonna work, so everybody's on the same page. Whatever works. It has to be fit for purpose, so you wanna choose the project management that fits that type of thing. A document through a content management system, you can do a document um, in chunks, but at some point in time, it's all gotta fit together and it's relatively linear. Or if you're writing it from start to finish, it's relatively linear. So that can go on a waterfall type thing. But when you're dealing with people and change, you want to do it in smaller iterations and make sure it's working before you continue. Choose project managers that understand and can apply different life cycles. So with that, you can either hire a trained project manager, and, and this all depends on your organization, whether it's big enough that you need project management as part of your organization, or do you need somebody who's in your organization to understand project management better. So you get some training. It's the same as pipe training. Well, we're gonna change something on you, so let's get you some training. So same idea, right? So how will it be done? The project design, do a really thorough, what do we have? What do we have and formalize it? Then do a gap analysis, what do we need for compliance? So that's contractual law regulation what it is that you need for compliance and what do you need from others as far as compliance goes. Then you want to comply with internal requirements and this is the beyond <coughs> compliance side of things. Now, I've, ha I've been involved in some discussions where you're looking at um, is safety management system simply compliance or safety management beyond compliance? And I would argue that safety management system is always to do with compliance because if you're not got a standard in place, you can't measure it. But what are you complying to? 
Now, I would argue that you're pushing your internal requirements. So you're complying to regulation, but you want to go for best practices. So you put in helicopters, flight data monitoring in place. Well, that's pushing your, re your internal requirement higher. So now you're <coughs> going to comply to that. Well, now we're going to look at some of our key performance indicators, and we're going to reduce this type of risk, and, or we're going to reduce the number of these types of incidents, unstable approaches or whatever. So we're going to put these sort of things in place. We're going to put training. We're going to put systems. We're going to get them new equipment, whatever it takes, and we're going to get them to that level. So now you have to comply to that. And then you're going to push it further. You're going to push it further. And you're always complying to your own internal requirements. It's still compliance. But you can measure it. Am I getting there? You put your key performance indicators, you have some target. This is what we're going to go to. And you can comply with that. And then you can keep pushing it from there. So I would argue that compliance is still there. And that way you can measure it. And you can see whether you're successful or not. That's continuous improvement. So the recipe for success, leadership and commitment, the top has to have that leadership and commitment. The staff have to see that the supervisors, the management, the executive at all levels are putting the money where their mouth is, they're giving the resources, they're the ones that have control of the resources, they're the ones that have the money, they have the time, the, the ability to give the time, the resources, the training, all these things that the organization has to, has to provide to the staff who are doing their job as best of their ability. You want to plug those holes in the Swiss cheese way up in the food chain. You don't want the people to have to manage it. They have enough on their hands, and they want to make sure that the fewest number of holes are down at the human element. The organization takes as much off their hands as you possibly can. Program management. Understand what it is you need for each part of your program. Agile project management, and that includes using different types of life cycles if you need them. Resources, project management, subject man management experts. You need subject management. Ah, I'm losing the talk. Subject matter management experts in their field, and you might want to bring in people that have nothing to do with it, just to listen and learn in a brainstorming session. Because it's it's surprising what some stupid question will come up with, and then they go, "Well, wait a minute, we actually never thought of that." When I do business analysis, I really find it entertaining because you get to a certain point. And you just can't connect the dots somehow. It just doesn't make sense. So you ask a whole bunch of stupid questions, and like, well, how do you get from here to there? And they try to tell you, and you try to math it, and it just doesn't make sense. And then what you find at the end, that there is actually a gap, and it's not being filled. So then you have something for your hazard log. Resources, safety management, safety subject matter experts. Get them trained. There's lots of training out there, and the technology to be able to support it. So that's anything from EGTWS, flight data monitoring, to your safety management tools, so the reporting um, systems, document control systems. You want all of these as well, because frankly, unless you're a very, very small company, you can't manage without these kind of tools. That looks like a duplicate. <laughs> Documentation, project management, software, and people. So to wrap it up, what do you have? Formalize it. Get it documented, mapped, however it works for you. Figure out where your gaps are to compliance. And then figure out what you want and gaps to the best practices. Do it one step at a time. Include all your stakeholders, even the guys looking over the fence. And most of all, take care of your people. And they'll take care of the company. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, just a note also, on the, in, on the iPad or iPhone app, there's a couple of attachments um, that I've put in there. So um, if you don't have access to that, just drop your, your business card and I'll email it to you. There's two things up th that I've put up there. One of them is a paper that we're going to be discussing at the Flight Data Monitoring Workshop tomorrow afternoon. And the other one is a link to um, our safety management system. I did a series of webinars that, I, that we recorded. They're only 15 minutes a piece. And they go through the ICAO SMS framework piece by piece at a beginner's level. 
It's open, it's free, you just sign up and you can download whatever it is you want. So it's useful for staff who don't know anything about SMS or just as a refresher. So that's up there on the iPhone app, otherwise just give me your business card and I will email it to you. Thank you.